please turn off cameras uh, during presentations will be good since we are quite many. So uh, we will have two presentations. Uh, so Björk Lund will present and discuss the future of smart control of heat pumps in district heating systems uh, from Göteborg Energy. And Kiona Joakim Nilén uh, will discuss how energy use in buildings can be reduced. He will present technology for control of heat and electricity use in buildings and what actions are required to reduce energy use. Uh, so as I said, um, I'll give a first uh, a short introduction of 10 minutes or so. And first, uh, just a few words about the MISTRA program. Uh, there is a web page, uh, MISTRA electrification, as you can see in the upper right corner. And the vision of this program is to accelerate the development towards a sustainable and efficient energy system. So it's an interdisciplinary uh, research program uh, where we have several universities and also we have partner companies where we address the energy transition, we focus on electrification. Um, and uh, we look both at the techno-economic aspects, and we all look at uh, study social acceptance, and uh, because, as you know, there are challenges with, uh, for instance, uh, siting of wind power. And we also look at um, feasibility of the transition, what are the other obstacles or, or barriers. And uh, we look at economy-wide effects, how this will, what implications it will have uh, on the economy at large. Uh, but you can look in the, uh, in the webpage, there are news and also uh, the, the program is described and uh, webinars like this are announced and so on. So, uh, first a little bit about a key issue in this program, which relates to today's seminar, is that um, compared to historically with the transition and with more non-dispatchable electricity generation and, and with the aim to get a more efficient system, we need to be much smarter how we use the energy. And therefore, this sector integration is an important aspect that we look at in, in different ways. And, and we have these sectors, transport industry and the built environment. And we, of course, have uh, energy generation, electricity and also heat, of course. And uh, in order to uh, make the transition in a smart way, we need to integrate those sectors much better than we have done historically. I just wanted to say a few words about that. and. With from an electricity perspective, of course, there is also the heating perspective. And what is very good for us here is that we have uh, lots of different technologies that we can use, and many of those we can control in a much smarter way than we have done historically, because we've had a quite stable and, and uh, yeah, the same we have had in Sweden, about 100, 140 terawatt hours of electricity demand for almost 30 years, or maybe even more than 30 years. But we have uh, a lot of both existing technologies like heat pumps that can be controlled smarter, uh, but we also have upcoming technologies. We have, of course, the electrification of the, of the transportation sector. We have electrofuel production. We have hydrogen-based steel making, stationary batteries, uh, possibly in further into the future, new nuclear power plants. Uh, and also, of course, that we can enhance and, and the energy infrastructure in terms of transmission capacity of electricity, and we will most likely also get some hydrogen uh, infrastructure. And all these can be, uh, for instance, hydrogen can be produced when we have uh, uh, lower electricity prices and stored in, in hydrogen storage. Heat pumps can be controlled in a smart way. The same with electrofuels, we don't maybe need to operate the unit when you have very high electricity prices. Uh, the smart charging of electric vehicles are, are also a possibility to, to be able to use uh, 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 the variations in electricity generation in a, in, a, in a smart way. Because if we just increase the amount or the share of uh, non-dispatchable electricity generation from in particular wind, but also solar, and if we do not do anything else, the value of those will be reduced. So it's important that we get those flexibility measures in place. And I just wanted to 
explain a little bit how, how we, we can look at that. And of course, we have load variations where we consume electricity and those vary, uh, of course, day and night and weekdays and weekends. And we have the electricity from wind and solar. This is just a future from a model. Uh, and if we take load variations and subtract the electricity from the non-dispatchable electricity generation, mainly wind and solar, and particular wind in our part of the world, we will get something that we call the net load. And the net load is the curve that we need to, we need to cover with other uh, 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 ways and either dispatchable generation or by shifting the load uh, in time. I just wanted to illustrate how this can look like. So here is a net, an example of a net load curve. Uh, uh, and um, the trick is then to cover it. And as you can see, it, it has both positive values and negative values. So sometimes there is a lack of electricity, we need to put in more, but also sometimes there is an excess of electricity, which can eventually lead to negative electricity prices. So we want this curve to be completely flat at zero. So of course we can trade, uh, uh, then we will reduce it a bit. Often the, the, the limitation, there are limitations in transmission capacity, and that is in the models that we use in this research program. Uh, we can also, if it's cost efficient, the models can invest in new transmission capacity. So we typically have models where we try to understand what are the possibilities and uh, to cover this net load curve. We can all have uh, hydropower, which we are very fortunate to have in Sweden. And this actually, I forgot to say, this is the South Sweden, uh, 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 the example here. And uh, we can see that then we cover quite substantial of this net load curve because uh, hydropower is a cost efficient way to have dispatchable electricity uh, generation. And then we have batteries. We can both have stationary batteries. Uh, we can also have this smart charging of electric vehicles, including vehicle to grid. And typically in our analysis in this product, we assume different share of the electric fleet that can charge in a smart way. Uh, and I can just mention here that we also have, currently we try to understand the driving patterns of electric vehicles by having a, a couple of hundreds electric vehicles that, are, that we log by GPS uh, units in the cars to understand the driving patterns and the charging patterns. patterns. So uh, those vehicles, uh, we record not only the driving patterns, but also the state of charge and uh, of battery and, and how they, when and to what extent they charge the batteries and, and how, how often. So that's a very important. We also have an, as you can see in left there, in a, a poll uh, that they, or, or a questionnaire that those voluntarily participating uh, vehicle owners fill out, uh, for instance, asking if they, how they look upon if they could uh, contribute with, with some system service to the grid and so on. And we find that they are very positive to that, which is very fortunate. And we also find that there are uh, a large potential for, for, for uh, participating in, in, in providing uh, uh, support for, for the grid. Because when we get many electric vehicles, it soon become quite a lot of of capacity, not so much energy, but uh, quite much capacity. So we can also have hydrogen production, and uh, this, of course, links to this in, in, mainly to the industry and these large industry products, such as the hybrid product and also the petrochemical industry for their transformation. So we can overinvest in electrolysers and have a uh, have hydro uh, have hydrogen storage and thereby avoid for those industries to purchasing electricity when when it's a high uh, uh, the electricity is is uh, is um, have high prices and coming to the topic of today we can also have uh, heat production or, or of course we can operate combined heater powers perhaps more flexible but connected to today's uh, talks as our heat pumps, and we have both heat pumps in the district heating network, but we can also have, uh, and we have, of course, uh, heat pumps at, at homes. 
And uh, here we have, I think, a quite low hanging fruit to some extent, because those are already in place. And of course, we need smarter control of them. And as you can see in this modeling, we see now that we have covered the net load curve. So we have got it to zero by these different measures. Important is to also to state that this exactly what role these different flexibility measures will have is system dependent. So what works for Sweden is not the same as will work for Germany. And maybe even what is the optimal for a, a, a price area one in Sweden is not the same as a price area four. So this is this is important. And this is what we are part of what we are looking at from this techno-economic analysis in the MISTRA program. Uh, so I think it's very exciting and uh, and there are many possibilities, but also challenges, of course, related to this. Finally, I would just like to say that I think when it comes to the the driving force for the trans, trans, transforming the energy system in general and including the electricity system. And I'm sorry, I have a Swedish uh, 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 slide here, my last slide. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I think there are two important aspects here. And one is the Fit for 55, and that is the EU's new climate framework. Uh, and uh, this will have a, if there is no backlash, I think this will have a, a, a strong impact on in particular, the industries of, of on Europe, and we see already that that uh, they have tried, started to respond to that. And of course, all these electrification projects are part of that. And we see that they will almost double the re reducing uh, how, how many emission allowances that will be reduced per year from 2.3 to 4.4 percent reduction. And even more important, perhaps, that the free allocation will be phased out. And, and that means that in year 2033, it will be completely phased out. And the industry has actually to pay the, the actual uh, cost. There will be no free allocation. And this will be replaced by a so-called carbon border adjustment mechanism, uh, uh, which will make that uh, some basic materials and other uh, uh, products that are consist of, of say mainly one uh, metal or so or, or carbon intensive material will be faced to the same carbon uh, pricing as within the EU in order to avoid carbon uh, leakage to other regions. The second thing is that the industry we see a, a, a strong enthusiasm in the industry setting up their own targets uh, and that will have an impact on the whole value chain and also obviously then on the energy supply, both when it comes to electricity and heat. Of course, in Sweden, we are fortunate that we already have a almost uh, climate neutral, both electricity and heat system, but still we, so therefore this is a competitive advantage of Sweden, I would say. We also see a strong enthusiasm with these uh, roadmaps within fossil free Sweden, fossil free Sverige, which I think is very uh, fortunate that we have those initiatives. So a lot of things, there are lots of positive things, but as we can see from the debate, sometimes it's, uh, there are some problems with polarization in the energy debate. And of course, we also have to secure a just transition, uh, which is a challenge. Uh, so that was just an introduction. And uh, now we will go to our two uh, very exciting presentations. Uh, so we have from, as I said, from Göteborg Energi of Björklund and from Kiona Joakim Nilén. And uh, yeah, we will start with Ulf from Göteborg Energi, so we are very eager to hear what you have to say. So I will stop sharing my screen here. Um, stop sharing. So yes, so please go ahead. Thank you and good morning to you all. Uh, I should just sorry. I should just say that we will do the list that uh, Ulf will present and uh, you will present, and I will try here with the help of Daniel to look at the chat so you can write in questions in the chat and then of course after the two presentations we will open up for questions and answers and also look at the chat so please yeah sorry Ulf. Uh, please go ahead. <laughs> it's okay I, I will try to share my presentation uh, thank you very much uh, you're talking uh, good English 
I have been been not using my English for a long while now. So so uh, if I, I if I eat, if I I um, uh, are not fluting, uh, you have to to excuse me by that. Gothenburg Energy. I I have been uh, for quite short time here. Uh, one of the the department managers uh, at something called the Energy System. Uh, we are planning the the Gothenburg uh, energy system uh, in the future. Uh, we are looking at um, 2045 as uh, as uh, how how the system will be looking like, uh, and it's quite hard to see, uh, of course, if, uh, as it is uh, further long, long in the uh, in the future. But what we see today is that the, the western part of Sweden and uh, Gothenburg is, is one of the, the driving motors for, for the whole Swede uh, development. Of course, the, the northern part uh, and, and the investment in, in both steel and, and uh, batteries uh, are very, uh, very big, but even that is also um, made in in uh, the area of the western part of Sweden uh, and Gothenburg. We have the the next picture. Uh, we have the Northvolt uh, battery factory uh, just building outside the uh, Gothenburg, where we have a lot of uh, action around. Uh, as you re know, we have also the the Volvo uh, factory that is employing a lot of people, and they are also expanding uh, a lot. Uh, so we at Gothenburg uh, Energy needs to be on, on top of that. Um, as this is coming around uh, the city needs to to develop and uh, uh, our city has a huge plan to to uh, uh, build new houses and uh, new ways to 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 uh, get uh, people in so uh, 150,000 more residents uh, we believe will will move into Gothenburg and they need, of course need homes to to uh, uh, live in so something like uh, 70 to 80000 new homes will be be developed here in in Gothenburg uh, and uh, the new factories uh, and uh, productions here in, in Gothenburg will give something like 80000 new uh, job opportunities so something is happening in, in, in the western part of, of, of Sweden, absolutely. So to the, to the subject uh, heat pumps, uh, what is uh, Gothenburg uh, doing just for the moment? And um, maybe we have read about it, but we are, are changing two of the old heat pumps that is uh, connected to the distributing heat system. Um, they will be taken out and in the, the same compartment we will uh, uh, put in the new uh, heat pump. A huge machine, uh, it has a heat uh, uh, load that uh, gives 50 megawatt at a coop of 3.5 and the temperature uh, out on the district heat is uh, 90 uh, degrees. It has a, a, a good uh, uh, yeah, here it comes uh, the, 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 the uh, Fluid in the machine is uh, this climate uh, good. Uh, ah, I, I lost that. Okay, the investment is three uh, three 
32.4 million euros, uh, so it's quite a huge uh, contract. Uh, and that is only for the machine. Then we have uh, uh, approximately uh, uh, 50 million, uh, maybe not. Uh, as you see, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. Uh, the, the contractor is uh, Strabag uh, together with Atlas Coco. So it's a, a quite uh, good team that uh, they have developed uh, for for this uh, this project, and uh, it will be finalized and into production uh, December 2026. Um, why do we do this? Yeah, they, it's mainly because uh, uh, North Volts uh, is together with the Volvo is building the uh, Novo plant uh, for building batteries in Gothenburg. Uh, the demand of uh, electric power to this uh, factory is uh, approximately 200 megawatt of, of electric power and uh, it needs to be cooled down in some way. Uh, and uh, the system has uh, been designed and uh, it's one of the reasons why the factory was uh, placed here in Gothenburg was uh, that we had a, a really good presentation and design for, for the factory. Uh, and we are may, uh, using the grey water from, from uh, the sewage plant uh, uh, to cool down the, the the, the process at the at the battery factory. Uh, so so that water will go through the the and comes up and uh, uh, is used in this new heat pump. So that the performance of of this new investment is really really good uh, due to that we we have a. Uh, high temperature on, on the uh, on the end of it. Um, the goal is that we we are having also the the distributing heat temperature at a high level, and that is also something that that um, is very. Um, what we are really aiming for that we, we get uh, prime prime uh, temperature on, on these heat pumps uh, also for for the next level of uh, of system um, as you know we have a lot of petrol chemical industry in uh, Gothenburg maybe uh, we have the Prim uh, refinery and we have also the the FT uh, where we are taking the the exhaust heat uh, uh, heat out of uh, and we, what we can see at uh, the these kind of process uh, if they are going to to go to climate uh, positive or climate neutral, uh, they need to have more power in electric power uh, and use uh, hydrogen uh, from a smarter way than than they do today. And uh, oh, yeah, there we see also that uh, the distributing heat grid is one of the key issues to uh, to uh, get uh, these kind of process to, to be economic and uh, uh, sustainable. Uh, so the heat pumps need to be delivering a high temperature out on the on the distributing heat. Uh, we are of course keen to to lower the temperature in the in the uh, distributing network but uh, as the city is also growing the that is all uh, the the biggest challenge for us that uh, 
we need to build more pipes uh, and uh, as you know that is also uh, hard to, to get into a, a dense uh, city. Um, so we have a struggle between that. But there were also uh, this uh, demand of the power into the uh, this city and, and uh, uh, environment, uh, we need to have the storage of heat. Uh, as as the, the power will be um, fluctuating up and down uh, daily or uh, also weekly. Uh, so this is an example of our newest uh, um, thinking uh, that we, we are going to put in a, a cooling and heat accumulator uh, just outside Gothenburg. One of the, the uh, we, we will change a little bit of the skyline of, of uh, Gothenburg. Um, just this week we had a, a, a presentation of, of this uh, new um, skyline. Uh, I think it's quite uh, nice. It's a new way to, to have a, a, the, the accumulator uh, in a huge city. What we are doing here is that uh, in the summer we are using it for, for uh, the distrib distributing uh, cool system. Uh, storing the the coolie uh, in the in the night and then giving it out in the in the in the day, uh, and uh, as we come into the autumn, we will change the the uh, the the work of the accumulator. So we are we are using it for the heat instead. That's a quite uh challenging project we will see if it, it will work uh we are just calculating and trying to 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 sort out the the thinking around it but i i think it's uh, one of the the one one good part of, of development uh, for for uh, both uh, uh heat cooling um and uh, are using the electric grid in a, in a good way that we, we can store heat into the distributing heat and cooling systems. Um, we, I think we will see more of these. Uh, we will also see other storage that we can put down the, the heat in. Um, as you know, there is more technology than, than uh, these kinds. What we also do uh, uh, at Gothenburg is, is that we are putting in a new project called Flexus. Uh, that is that we can control and uh, manage the the customer's uh, system. Uh, we can uh, have a lot of data collect it and we can can also learn and uh, lead the system uh, and i believe that this flexus system will be one of the part of the the heat pumps uh, and i have, of course and you also have have seen that uh, we we uh, we will have more flexibility uh, more uh, uh, managing from the uh, from from uh, pricing, um, the power grids will be uh, have have system or or pricing that will also give the the incentivement to to get uh, more more flexible. Uh, using of, of uh, heat pumps in the systems. Um, yeah, the future, the future of Gothenburg is that uh, there will be more wind power into the systems. 
uh, the petrochemicals industry are here to stay, uh, we believe, and uh, all the excess uh, heat that is coming out of these kind of process, we will really be on top of to to uh, to distribute in our our system and in, in the growing city of Gothenburg and and around us. Um, but we have a we we need to to work together, of course. Uh, and um, yeah, I I think I will stop there uh, and open up if there is some question around. Yeah, maybe we can take quick. There are some quick questions on the uh, first about the cooling uh, shield medium, and then there were some questions also on on the capacity of that uh, heat storage accumulator. Yeah, yeah, the the, the cooling system uh, or the the shield media is a uh, six hundred the baton. Okay, and the capacity. Ah, oh, there here it says uh, the. Uh, 33,000 cubic meter, is that yep. the size? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. Okay. It will be uh, something like 65 uh, meters oh. high, 26 or 27 meters wide. So so it's a, a quite quite big accumulator. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we can come back and maybe have a, a more general discussion or, uh, uh, after the next presentation. So. Thank you. Thank you very much Ulf, for this very interesting overview. It looks exciting as it's nice to live in Göteborg. There's things happening. <laughs> so, of course, all the new buildings and so on. Uh, yes, so uh, I think I have give the word to you, Joachim, at the Kiona. So, please. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, see if I can share my screen. It's always and, thrilling. So. Yeah, yeah, let's see. <laughs> yes, it we works. Have something showing up. Yes. Perfect. So <clears throat> uh, let's start. Uh, there we go. So, yes, <clears throat> my name is Joachim Nerén. Uh, I am a product manager. <laughs> product manager in the building management segment at uh, Kiona. So uh, if, a bit of background, I'm a developer at heart, uh, been doing that for a really long time uh, and uh, also working within building automation all the way back since 2001. Uh, but I've been focusing a lot on development of SCADA systems and integration of the control systems that are in our buildings and especially after two, 2009 and ahead. So that is kind of uh, my background and what I will use uh, when we talk about the questions we have here today when it comes to uh, uh, reducing the energy use in our buildings uh, using smart controls uh, and also how we can follow up and monitor and what type of data we need to actually do the controls in the in the first place. Uh, and, and also what are the challenges to get data on board and access to all the control systems in our buildings. So a bit of background. So uh, the buildings, yeah, we have the property owners uh, and uh, they have some challenges when it comes to this since we have uh, both old and new buildings and in the buildings we have both old and new technology uh, and they're coming also stricter requirements, increased pressure on ESG targets and uh, we have the volatility uh, as we've seen in the uh, few years back with the energy costs, uh, and also kind of the, the things we talked about here today in the previous presentations. Um, yeah, so we, that drives kind of the uh, the digitalization and the digital roadmap for, for the property owners. So we get the buildings connected uh, to be, so we can gather data and uh, get the right insights, uh, how, how our, our building perform, uh, performing. And also uh, when it comes to, to residential buildings and also office buildings, of course, we, we need to see how is the indoor climate. Uh, so when we optimize buildings, uh, yeah, we need to keep the, the tenants satisfied uh, <laughs> as well, uh, not only uh, look at the net operational income and things like that. Uh, and of course, we have the uh, environment to take into account. 
it's not always hand in hand with saving money and saving uh, uh, thinking about the environment. I will touch a bit more on that uh, later as well. Uh, so Kiona, we, we're a company focusing on uh, uh, services and software. So we have a few softwares that covers these areas. We have the uh, first uh, product that I've been part of developing called Webport, and that is uh, HMI and SCADA systems used to connect all the control systems in the building and uh, give tools to handle alarms, uh, logging of data over time, and uh, be able to uh, mm, uh, for the technical persons handling the building to, to work efficiently uh, with the building so they are perform performing well. Um, and then we have Edge, which is a software for optimization on the energy for residential buildings primarily. Uh, and it also has tools for uh, indoor climate uh, visualization with 3D models and to keep uh, yeah, stable indoor climate. And when it comes to reporting and uh, tracking, uh, energy and waste and uh, stuff like that. We have the uh, energy net uh, platform that is yeah, for, for reporting energy management and stuff like that. Uh, so for the first question, uh, what is the potential to reduce energy in our buildings? Uh, and when, especially when it comes to, to smart control. Uh, and it's not just a straight answer on that. So we have to first think about what, uh, why are we optimizing in the first place? Is it to just uh, save money, uh, reduce energy to save money, or is it to lower CO2 emissions? Uh, is it to optimize uh, toward indoor climate, or is it like we talked about here, the grid optimization, or maybe a combination of all of these? Um, and it's not always that they align and have the same answer. So uh, there needs to be some incentives in a way and a collaboration to to actually, uh, in in some ways, change user behavior as well, not just uh, do pure optimization. Uh, and what means do we have to, to opt optimize? So what is connected in the building? What, what can we influence with our control strategies? Uh, what type of uh, ventilation, heating and cooling systems are there? Uh, and what is the what type of building is it? Uh, and what is it for? It's not always that you can have the same approach uh, for, for all buildings. Uh, and also, when you looked into optimization and you add in a lot of new technology, there's an impact of that technology itself that also needs to be taken into account. So I will focus a bit on that part uh, because the Giona uh, and the Edge platform was part of a, a study uh, together with Ericsson and Carbon Trust that looked at the whole kind of uh, the big picture of the whole Edge AI technology uh, together with a communication network provided by Ericsson <clears throat> and how that impacted the environment um, and the savings in, in, in the buildings. So it was a study done uh, last year and uh, it uh, included 356 buildings in both Sweden and Finland. Uh, they had district heating connected uh, so and, and the kind of buildings for for the northern climate so so not, not the thinnest walls and stuff like that so and and a good uh, energy uh, providing solution with the, with the district heating as well <clears throat> so what this study looked into, it's not just uh, the effect of the optimization, but also took into what's called here the first order effect that covers the whole life cycle emission of hardware. So, uh, so uh, Edge can be de uh, delivered as a service uh, connected to hardware that we uh, basically exchange the outdoor temperature uh, and connect it to controllers. So we don't need any other type of system to deploy the service, but that in turn includes some hardware that needs to be put into the buildings. And we also have sensors for monitoring indoor climate and stuff like that. So, so that of course in itself uh, have, have impact on the environment. And uh, when it comes to machine learning and services as a whole, we have uh, cloud solutions and uh, we have an uh, impact from that. Um, and we also have the, the Rainu network uh, provided by Ericsson. So a lot of things that provide 
uh, kind of an uh, impact on the environment that it needs to be taken into account. So that was part of, the, of this uh, study. Uh, so we have some numbers here for how many kilograms of CO2 emissions per square meter and year uh, on average for, for these buildings. And then we have the second order effect, which is uh, the optimization itself. So, the, so basically how much energy are we saving and what is the equivalent CO2 emission for that? Uh, and we have the net secondary effect, which is yeah, the, the, what is the actual saving, uh, which in this case ended up uh, around 7% uh, and avoiding one kiloton of CO2 equivalent and uh, saving of 17.3 million kilowatt hours of, of energy. So this is a really nice uh, result, of course, but uh, also nice to think about when it comes to the, the bigger picture, uh, when it comes to the optimization parts. And uh, like I mentioned before, it's connected to very much what type of buildings are we optimizing. So uh, an, a number can range far more than, than this uh, if, if it's a building where we have much greater potential. Let's say you have coal for energy, then the, an input would be uh, vastly different. Uh, uh, so let's move on. So when it comes to documentation and monitoring, reporting uh, for for the control and optimization, we, we need to uh, see what, what kind of data is needed for the optimization itself. Um, uh, and that, of course, depends on uh, how and what we, we optimize. Uh, and uh, like I touched on earlier here, we have the, uh, do we control through an additional hardware or is it a software only approach? Uh, so for, for the Edge platform, we can uh, both deliver the service through in combination with hardware, but we can do it as a software only approach where we have, um, if you have a, a SCADA system, uh, that mon uh, building management system that, that has all the, uh, the relevant information already connected, we can uh, through APIs uh, do optimization uh, and, and that requires some additional data points. So instead of uh, simulating an equivalent outdoor temperature, we, we need to kind of influence the heating curve instead. And that requires fallback strategies and uh, additional data points uh, into to the optimization itself. And also if you come to more complex buildings and, uh, and you have uh, even more advanced machine learning algorithms, you need even more data to, uh, to both train the models and, and use them for optimization. And then of course, yeah, what are you uh, optimizing the building for? Is it looking ahead when it comes to weather? And uh, in this case, uh, electricity. Uh, and then we also have to take into account what kind of uh, uh, agreement you have with your uh, provider. Is it uh, spot price or is it some other uh, form, uh, fixed price uh, model? Uh, and also, if you have residents and you have to really need to take uh, indoor climate into account, then yeah, that will also uh, require additional data to, to actually make sure that you, 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 you hit your targets when it comes to the indoor uh, climate. Uh, so that, uh, that is also something that uh, coming a lot now with the IoT sensors and uh, a rollout of those in the buildings. Uh, but then we also have the almost as important, uh, how, how do we follow up on these optimizations? So we actually see that we get the value that we, we say we will. Um, and also it's important to measure so, so you get the, the full picture, not just capturing kind of a direct effect from, from uh, the optimization itself, but uh, also possible indirect effects. So let's say you optimize the heating system and then uh, you have ventilation as well, then you ha uh, have the risk of the, the ventilation covering for the savings you thought you did on, on the, the heating part. So it's, it's important to have everything into account. Uh, and also when you compare data, uh, could be one building year to year uh, or between different buildings that you have some kind of normalization of the data so it's actually comparable. Uh, 
And also, of course, if you, uh, <laughs> you're trying to find something, it's all, all, always the risk of, of having some kind of uh, confirmation bias. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's always good to have this uh, strategy of measuring more, more, more rather than less. But that is also something that uh, costs money, of course, if you have to measure more. Uh, it's not always that you have the energy meters in all levels uh, submetering to, to get all this information. So that that is also an additional cost and uh, environmental cost to, to the whole uh, digitalization of the building and uh, gathering of data. Uh, so uh, I touched a bit on the softwares earlier, so I just briefly mentioned them again. So on the optimization part, we have the edge solution, but that of course also have the uh, the data reporting uh, connected to the service, so we actually can follow up uh, on the on the the performance of the optimization itself. And of course, uh, connected to the indoor climate, which is really important for the edge platforms, and this is mostly residential buildings. Uh, and then we have the energy net, uh, and uh, this could also be important when you have uh, um, build, uh, larger buildings or uh, buildings that are targeting kind of uh, green building certifications or other type of certifications that you need to measure a lot of data to, so you can actually prove that you're hitting those targets. Uh, so that is. Uh, One thing to take into account as well. So yes, uh, the the large uh, the large thing here. <laughs> we have the optimization and we have the reporting on it. But yeah, how do we get the the data on board? Uh, especially with, like I mentioned earlier, the, this both old and new control system and a lot of different providers of those control systems that are in our buildings, uh, and. There are a lot of communication protocols, and this is kind of where I've been struggling <laughs> a lot with uh, throughout the years. Uh, we have uh, um, with Webport, we, we, we always had the strategy of it being an open and flexible uh, software, so we can connect not only to a specific uh, provider of our hardware, it should be able to connect all the hardware that's uh, in our building and provide uh, an ex user experience and a uh, data uh, storage that is uh, kind of standardized in a way, so you can always work the same way, regardless of what, what system, control system you have. Uh, so that, that would be the webport uh, platform uh, that I mentioned about earlier. So uh, I don't think we will dive any deeper into to that one. Uh, we will touch a bit more on it uh, and how it is delivered. Uh, but something that could be uh, mentioned is uh, there is some features within webport that can be used to, to actually build uh, control strategies within uh, the system itself. We have the uh, scripting functionalities and different way of doing optimization. Um, uh, and since and we deliver it uh, both locally on on-site installations in building and centrally to, to get, uh, get an overview if you have many buildings, it's an easy access point to to add additional services so they don't have to come from, from Keona. It could be we work with uh, all major uh, providers of optimization solutions on the, on the market, uh, especially in Sweden, uh, I would say, uh, and that they pr can provide services through their, their API. And also when it comes to Edge, we can also provide that, not just through Webport, but through other uh, SCADA systems as well. So that is really nice to have that. Uh, being strong together, working together uh, as a group, as uh, uh, Ulf also mentioned, it's a really go uh, good way to, to collaborate. Um, so when we deliver our systems, we don't do it ourselves. We work through our partners, uh, the system integrators, uh, could also be energy advisors and property managers, of course. Uh, but they have a lot of creativity themselves and, and do a lot of solution on top of, of what we already deliver. Uh, so I will sh show a few examples from that. 
Uh, so one thing was back in uh, 2022 when we had these spikes in, in energy prices, uh, Kiona, we developed a, a, a way of providing spot price data to our softwares and solutions. Uh, and for, for Webport, we have this uh, way of programming using puzzle pieces. Uh, so we added the, the possibility to bring in the, the spot price data into that. So we can uh, see what, yeah, what what is developed from our partners using this this pos new possibility. Uh, I actually did some uh, uh, testing at home myself, uh, and I introduced, yeah, what was called the the suffering curve. So since we had really high prices on electricity, uh, we we. Um, I, I uh, made a curve that set the uh, in, uh, indoor temperature depending on the, the price of electricity. So uh, how much are we willing to suffer <laughs> depending on the price of electricity, basically. And uh, this was actually put into use by uh, one of our partners as well. Uh, could be more. It's not always that we get the information, but uh, in this case, we got a real nice LinkedIn post uh, from uh, one of our partners that uh, actually used spot price for controlling indoor temperatures. Uh, and they provided a graph here where we see the, the, the price of, of the energy throughout the day and how that is influences the, the set point for the indoor temperature. Uh, and then also a few years back, I think it was uh, 2016 or something, we actually did a, a, a project together with Chalmers Fastigheter and Göteborg Energi, uh, where we looked at uh, a building in uh, Chalmers in Gothenburg. Uh, we, they had two, if I remember correctly, two uh, large uh, heat pumps, uh, and they also had district heating. Um, so uh, what was developed was that uh, Göteborg Energi provided uh, kind of spot price for for the district heating part. Uh, and in this case, I think they had a flat price for, for electricity, but we took into account the COP of the heat pumps to get uh, a comparable uh, price per kilowatt hour. And that uh, was part of the control strategy for selecting if uh, we should uh, run on, on district heating or use the heat pump. And uh, uh, this table just shows a bit how the data could look. Uh, so sometimes we had an actual cooling need so, and the, the heat pump was used both for cooling and heating. So sometimes we were forced to use the, the heat pump, uh, but sometimes the price decided if we should do the one or the other strategy. I actually don't know what the current status of this is, but it might be an interesting approach to to look into again when we have a kind of this larger grid optimization when it comes to electricity as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it co comes a bit back to the, the discussion around incentives and having the correct incentives to, to change user behavior and uh, prioritize what we do uh, basically. Um, and to summarize some key takeaways uh, from, from this is, yeah, be clear on why we optimize. So we have uh, everything on the, on the table uh, and can do the prioritizations and find the right incentives for, uh, for the, the control strategy that is used. And also that everyone is on both uh, on board. So my, you understand wh why things are happening. Um, and also make sure to get the complete picture so you can do, draw the right conclusion. And of course, uh, as Ulf also said, work together. <laughs> uh, yeah, collaboration is key. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Joachim, for this interesting talk. So, very good. Uh, yeah, so uh, let's see now. We have some questions here. So maybe I'll, I'll start directly with you, Joachim, since since you were last here. So we have, um, yeah, first uh, we've addressed a question. What are the common loads that are flexible in buildings? I think it's a very good question. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I guess that is also connected to what type of activity is going on, on the, in, in the building. Uh, but, it, but it could, of course, be heat pumps and ventilations, uh, uh, fans and uh, yeah, 
a lot of different parts, but uh, you need to know what is actually needed. And then when it comes to, like you mentioned, Philip, who had the uh, charging of cars and stuff like that, that's also a big, uh, uh, should we have a optimization of when it's a, a possible to charge cars? Uh, and what would be an, an incentive for 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 that? Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess uh, we have a little thought about that as well. I mean, I guess that in the future when we have more, let's say, electrif electrified transport section, and maybe also for heat pumps, that I think that it should be automatic. I mean, the, the customer or the, or the consumer should not really need to care that much. Maybe have some simple choice whether the a car should be fully loaded the next day or a, or a fully charged or, or if they could accept uh, some some uh, some lower uh, state of charge for the car, but I guess it has to be, uh, and I guess that's similar what you work with. I mean, it has to be quite user friendly systems. Yeah. I guess, uh, yeah, absolutely. There is also a question on uh, you showed some, uh, yeah, the resulting CO two savings, uh, and there is a question: What is the emission factor used for calculation emission savings for a case such as this? European uh, electricity mix or Nordic or Swedish? Uh, I, yeah. I actually don't have all the data. I can provide a link at, uh, to the to the report. Uh, hopefully there is more information regarding the details there. I can just mention that it, it was used. Uh, it was done using the ITU TL1480 standard, which is quite new standard for uh, for this kind of calculations. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm no expert in this field, I would say, yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I can provide a link to the report in the in the chat if you want to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's probably appreciated. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. And then we have some. Uh, uh, there are some technical questions also for Ulf on the on the uh, heat pump. Um, a little bit about this. Um, uh, let's see. There was the. Um, Something about are there any risks with this propane as as the cooling uh, media? Uh, yeah, I have to 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 rephrase that because it's uh, R six hundred A isobutane uh, that okay, is used in, in, in yeah. these machines. Uh, the 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 compressor is a four stage compressor, as I, I have understood. Um, but really, the technical the details are, are not my my table to 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 answer. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's see. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I guess maybe one one question would be, and what do you see Ulf, in the future? Um, what will be the possibility for 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 these big machines, so to say, to take active part in in some sort of flexibility or variation management, as we sometimes call it? I mean, there is also this to shift load in time, but there would also be, of course, maybe something some other system service. Like, uh, what do you think? See, there is it is it flexible, or to what extent would such a heat, big machine be flexible? I believe that they they can be be not extremely flexible, but uh, uh, of course it, uh, they 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 are on the on the power grid, so so we we can manage to to move load in time uh, as we are adding uh, accumulators in, in the heat systems. Um, so so I I, I really. We we really need to be flexible uh, at the at uh, the new systems in, in the city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think the possibilities are are are, are quite quite. There are many possibilities. I guess. It's, yes. Uh, to, uh, so I don't know, and uh, or I think also we are quite many, seventy people. But I think you can, if you have a question, you can also. See if you can raise your hand or simple, simply uh, turn off your uh, turn on your microphone. And there we have, uh, yeah, Daniel, you have raised your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to. There were some questions earlier in the chat. I'll help 
for you to remind about yeah. that, Philip. I think that was the first question we got maybe were uh, the, directed to all of you. What would you consider pumped hydro as a storage method? What do you say, Philip? Yeah, I saw that one. Yeah, I mean, in uh, in our modeling in this project, we are not uh, including that yet. We do have a project, um, it's actually uh, also from another project, where we develop the description of the Swedish hydropower in these models. It's together with the KTH and, and uh, uh, among others. And... Um, to be, because it's quite complex to model in these type of models to model hydropower. But we, as far as I know, we don't have that yet, uh, pumped hydro. Uh, what I know is that in continental Europe, they've had more um, uh, traditional pumped hydro, uh, but that's been for day and night uh, 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 shifting. But now with, with quite much wind power, those hydropower plants, uh, these pumped hydropower plants have, have some challenges because th those we have different type of, of variations. Of course, there are, uh, I know that Vattenfall is also investigating if the possibility to convert uh, back one uh, that I think was used to be a pumped hydro plant. I think there are three in Sweden, but they haven't really been used that much. Um, so. That's what I know. I don't know if, yeah, I, I think neither Joachim nor Ulf are, are in the possession or, or working with the, any hydropower, I guess. Uh, there are projects I can say also about using mine shafts to old uh, abandoned mines to, to uh, for pumped hydro or storage, maybe one could say, using water. Uh, uh, but I think it's been difficult to get uh, them profitable. There's also, I think, a challenge with these flexibilities that when you want to build it, you need to speculate in what will be the future need for that. Uh, and that's uh, for sure there will be much more flex uh, need for flexibility, I think, because we expect uh, a much increased share of uh, non dispatch electricity generation in the energy system. But uh, yeah, let's see if there were some other. Uh, so there were about this. I think this was solved with the refrigerant. Uh, the, um, there is a question about. A oh, okay. Yeah, just go ahead. Oh, okay, was it me? Uh, yeah, ah, yeah. I, I just uh, sort of thinking about uh, what is your view on. Uh, and, and maybe also for Ulf, uh, when it comes to batteries at, at home, uh, we had a, have this uh, where yeah, everyone puts up solar panels, but uh, there's not that much batteries at home yet. But that could, I guess, if you have some volume in the battery side at home, we could balance and help uh, the, the grid as well. Uh, Yeah, it, it's uh, it's not my my side of the of the table. Uh, as as batteries is uh, um, into into the grid, uh, that that is good part. But um, as we see, it's more uh, economic uh, efficient to to store the the over heat overload in, in to 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 uh, water instead of of uh, batteries of course but uh, that is my 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 opinion in in this subject oh, we do we have seen uh, 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 quite a, an explosion of of a battery uh, a stationary battery but that's mostly driven by this uh, to selling this uh, fast frequency res reserve to the Svenska Kraftnät, to the TSO. So I think that, that's what we've seen. And of course, now when we have all those batteries that they can in the future, also, of course, also be available for, for variation management uh, of peak shaving and so on. Uh, of course, they're still, I guess, for home consumers, they are, they are um, quite expensive. But uh, you know that this uh, a firm in Göteborg, check what they for a while they in, they install they they supply software uh, for this uh, 
and they install 4,000 systems per month for, for a while. So, so there is a big interest, I think, in that. Uh, uh, and then with these Ws, when we we'll get more uh, 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 electric vehicles that can also participate, I think that that's interesting. Of course, you need some uh, aggregator like a virtual power plant to control this because as a customer, you cannot yeah, there is certain capacity you need to be able to participate in the market. So, but I think it's. I, I learned that they said it was uh, a third of these battery systems were uh, private consumers, a third was for other uh, companies, and a third was for for um, big systems with big containers, so typically managed by big utilities uh, like Vattenfall and so on. So, I think that's. Um, Let's see. Um, is this worth shifting heat sources? There is a question. Is it worth shifting heat sources to district heating and heat pumps to optimize energy cost and provide flexibility for commercial and office buildings? If so, how large is the potential market in Sweden? I guess it's a it's anyone who wants to volunteer there. I guess it's a tricky question, perhaps. Mm. Anyone who yeah, wants to try to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually not. <laughs> but I guess we've, we've had a problem, I guess, so far that many of these, uh, in particular in the built environment, that there are many efficiency measures that are of course, uh, maybe not obviously profitable, but there are also those for sure that would be profitable, but they are not happening because there are so many uh, actors involved and split incentives and so on. So I, I think that could probably go for this as well. But I also know that the office buildings, it's quite uh, many companies uh, put a high value into having a modern uh, efficient buildings as part of their sort of branding. And, and, and I think the the targets they have and on, on sustainability and so on. So I think we see more and more of that. I'm, I'm sure that you both, uh, Ulf and Joachim, you, you also experienced that when, when in particular for new office buildings that they they want to show that it's the, those who rent a building the, or buy a purchase a building that it's uh, up to date. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And also connected to financial part when you build. Yes. Costs. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah the, the, the rating of the building. Yeah. Uh, then there was another, how does flexibility in building scale when controlling for price? Spot prices are set for one load profile when that profile changes, so Göteborg Energy needs to go to the intraday market. Is there a cost penalty to electricity suppliers for this? Is that something you... No, it's not my area to, 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 to answer that question. Um... I will pass. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I guess it is, as we said, a challenge that, of course, you have the information, what are the variations in spot price today, but of course, uh, what to expect in the future is, is not obvious. So, so I guess that's somewhat of a challenge. Uh, maybe one can bet on with some certainty that variations will, will not be go away, but they will increase uh, if we manage to transform the energy system, I think. Uh, that's that's like what we see from our models. Well, I mean, we are not predicting the future, but we are modeling for various scenarios and, of course, that meet the targets of uh, climate and, and, of course, the, in the electrification for industry. And, and since for the next 10 years or so, the major share of new electricity generation will be wind power, most likely, because it will take time until we possibly could have a nuclear power, new nuclear power plants. And, and of course, then we will get more volatility in the electricity system, as well as also that we see a large expansion of um, uh, wind power, including offshore in our surrounding regions. So I think this is here definitely to stay. So I think if, if it's near, uh, profitable today. I think it, with having such systems, I think it would be more profitable in the future, most likely, if if the politicians do not include uh, in for some sort of uh, intervent market intervention to to lower the 
the volatility in the prices. There are some such ideas uh, because we want this just transition and, and avoid too high electricity prices would be very difficult for for to get the yeah the general public to accept. But I think it's it's important to have a balance there to to really use this. We could see that of course in the uh, with this uh, uh, the Russian war on Ukraine where we got very high electricity prices and uh, there is an interesting report uh, from if you look at Energiforsk homepage where they they could see that that we we directly saw a, a, a substantial uh, possibility for for energy savings. Uh, so so there is for sure uh, a potential, I think. Uh, uh, there was a, po a question on again on the heat pump. Is it possible to reach a coefficient of performance of 3.3 with a high sub cooling? Question is that the way you reach high coefficient of performance? Uh, I guess it has an immediate an intermediate cool compressor or something, or is it the one step? Is that is the question? I guess. No, no, also... it, 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 I, I, I believe the system is is built up uh, by four compressors. Okay. So, it, yeah. so it's quite complex, uh, and uh, our inlet temperature from from the sewage water is uh, ten degrees. Uh, so so at ten degrees in, uh, we can reach uh, high efficiency in the in the system. Um, so it's an extreme machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I guess so. Since it's since it was that costly, I hope it's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, uh, that sounds very likely. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's a quarter past, uh, and I think we've, we've and we have had very good discussions. And if there are no other questions, I. Uh, seems not to be uh, then i would like to thank you both you are kim uh, from kiona and ulf from Göteborg energy for two very interesting uh, talks and uh, for a good discussion so uh, thanks a lot and uh, yeah okay bye all thank you bye bye, bye everyone bye bye, bye.